A warm May morning in Logan, Utah. Birds are out. They fill the air with song. Having just seen her youngest of three children off to school, Rose Pettigrove begins preparing a fresh spice cake. She descends into the pantry to retrieve a can of molasses. As she returns to the kitchen, she senses a twinge. The sudden pain stops Rose cold. She clutches her chest where the Amalga 300 robotic heart was transplanted six years ago. 9.23 a.m., seconds after recognizing that something was wrong, Rose Pettigrove collapses. At 33, she is dead. Her robotic heart having chosen to cease normal function. Investigator Dominic Kane gives a detailed description of the scene. The Pettigrove story hardly makes the local evening news. Iron Mountain, New Hampshire, a charming year-round ski town. Cab driver Bryn Cunningham cuts through traffic on his way across town. A family of four is his fare. No one seems to have a care in the world until Cunningham makes a sharp left turn onto Lawn Street. His artificial right arm seizes, taking control of its own fate and the fate of the other passengers as it redirects the cab into traffic. After the wreckage is cleared and bodies are sorted out, local authorities find an Amalga 400, popularly called the Flexer, fleeing from the scene. Afula, a small prosperous town in northern Israel. The Levy family has twin boys, Aaron and Yusuf. The latter is named for his grandfather. He's an outstanding athlete and unlike his younger brother, quite scholarly. When polio consumes Yusuf's body, the family opts for an artificial leg. Moments before it's triggered, the leg comes to life. Technicians are uncertain what to do. Hesitation that costs the boy his life. The Levy family is devastated. When Cain calls, they refuse to comment about the death of their son. Why are only Amalga models of robotic life support failing? Debate rages as the worldwide death toll spirals out of control. A London Times editorial refers to this as a new herald in artificial intelligence. Protesters organize. Some people question whether or not this is a time of peace, or if instead, this is war. A war waged against an enemy whose methods of collaboration lie far beyond human comprehension. Where will people turn? Tokyo, Japan a city that for generations has come to stand for technological innovations. Senator Hideki Takahashi is a leader in the global scientific community. In speeches, Takahashi comes out strongly against protesters. He claims that they only serve to fuel a culture of fear and what he calls a Luddite sense of irrationality. The press receives word that Takahashi serves on Amalga's board. The senator attempts to resign. It is too late, though. His body is burned, hung in effigy from the Tokyo Stock Exchange for all the world to see. One by one, cities go up in smoke. 
a 24-hour curfew is put in place in Cheyenne, Wyoming. Pirates seize the port in Casablanca. The Buenos Aires streets, once vibrant, are emptied. Government agencies slow their investigations, focusing efforts on maintaining public safety. At the tender age of 14, Oksana Kadrova was considered something of a national treasure in her country of Russia. At only 21, the talented opera star was among the most sought after performers on earth. She is outspoken, particularly about issues of human rights. While performing Carmen at Bolshoi Opera House in Moscow, in a bleak winter evening, Kadrova abruptly takes her own life. Midaria. The crowd is horrified. The Russian people mourn. Investigators turned the obvious question. Why? Why would one of the world's biggest stars take her own life at the height of her fame? Kadrova's final journal entry may contain a vital clue. She tells a heartbreaking tale. During a recent rehearsal, her teacher's Amalga 700 auditory device tore out through her ear. In the last words she wrote, Kadrova describes in lurid detail the sound of her skull shattering. A counselor leaked to the news. Russian Premier Kovalev takes a mute stance in the matter. Protesters storm the Kremlin. Through sheer force of numbers, they overcome guards, penetrating to the very heart of the Russian government. They are one step away from the Premier's panic room when the last protester is turned back. Order is maintained. At least for the time being. Dominic Kane was just a junior investigator for the Logan Police when he got his first big break. Kane possesses an uncanny intuition, solving high-profile criminal cases all across the Southwest. When first assigned to the Rose Pettigrove case, even Kane could see that he was in over his head. In spite of the odds, though, Kane was optimistic. He dug into the case notes, looking deeper than anyone else had ever gone before. Were there relics of communication? Perhaps something transmitted from Pettigrove's heart that fateful morning. Distress signal? Maybe a call to arms? Kane delved deeper. But how far did Kane go? Rumors spread like wildfire. Theories. Something malignant in the source code. Some experts theorize. Some experts asserts. Theory organized. This is 